Okay, so basically what I'm going to go over is there's a lot of QML uh, healthcare papers out there, and in specific, these quantum support vector machines and variational quantum uh, circuits are the two most popular uh, that you'll see. And, um, you know, basically, these are some early stages. There's been, you know, attempts to get it for COVID, you know, for lung, uh, you know, diagnosis uh, during COVID, but uh, it takes a while to fully understand. And there's issues with today's uh, deep learning as it is um, to get FDA approval. So the articles two through five will focus on that. So it's basically um, this whole story from about 2020 until now of, you know, how this has been implemented uh, over the course of these years. And basically these different steps that people have taken with um, encouraging the FDA um, and then getting to this uh, point with the software as, as a medical device or SAM to get these SPS or ACPs, uh, these protocols to change um, basically within days, you know, these uh, new updated algorithms. And then, you know, the other article similar, uh, basically the FDA's kind of uh, uh, response to a lot of this. Now, I picked out four of these. So these are four big healthcare quantum machine learning articles. In specific, the first one is one of the largest QML studies. Uh, they focus on empirical quantum computing for rheumatoid arthritis. Now, quantum machine learning is actually the, the primary application for quantum computing. Um, so you're going to hear a lot more about QML, and especially it's good to see the big names. So at the bottom, you're at IBM, Amgen, Roche, and these other big papers there too. Um, but basically, you know, uh, using quantum neural networks for the Roche uh, QCWare, and, um, you know, Roche's top 10 pharmaceutical, IBM's, you know, uh, top 50 in, in for, uh, Fortune 500. And then cognitive computation and the, with these COVIDs. So basically, you know, sometimes we're able to get, and I mean, as a, as a whole society of, of quantum, to get, uh, you know, decent results uh, with COVID-19. Um, it's just, you know, it, during that whole time of trying to get it, uh, you know, a breakthrough device or special approval, it uh, doesn't appear that it happened quite yet for quantum. And then you'll see with the last one with CT imaging number four. Now, this first article, Quantum Machine Learning Applications in the Biomedical Domain, a Systematic Review. So this is a 2020. Um, actually, this is a 2022. And in specific, this is uh, QML. And they're narrowing it down to their 30 best articles. So in this case, quantum neural network approaches, you can, in most cases, use the significant use of quantum processing to improve neural nets. Um, and then, you know, potentially later on, once the qubits get up and the, the noise goes down, exploring potential quantum phenomenon in the brain. Um, and it, again, we could do partial kind of a lot of these things. Um, so I, there's QSVM, which, you know, VQC, those are the top two. And then there's other uh, techniques as far as the level of quantumness. And I'll get to as far as, you know, what, what does it mean to have a locked algorithm versus one that's more learning? Um, now, it's kind of surprising, actually, so India is the number one in QML and healthcare, and then so you see U.S., and then some of the, um, you know, the European countries as well as being the most prevalent, um, and I believe this art is it's based on the articles that they looked at for QML in healthcare in specific. Now, there's different things you can do. So, obviously, I focus on biomedical imaging and these quantum machine learning approaches to get better images for Alzheimer's prediction. And then there's also omics, you know, so genomics, medical records, so EHRs, EMRs, biosignals, and I may touch on that as far as the company uh, future direction. So that's quantum sensing. Um, so, you know, basically this goes through and then you have uh, some form of a, a neural network at the end that you're dealing with through, through the computer. So, like I said before, QML is the most common application of quantum computing. Uh, when I, really started focusing on the medical aspect of this. I, you know, I've heard things about as far as, you know, uh, you know, quantum machine learning being a hot topic, but, you know, researching it more and more, and it, it just makes sense that it's, it's basically going to be the number one use. Now, um, there's been, so some of these are COVID studies, so classification, severity, uh, you'll see the fourth bullet point, a detection and classification of cervical cancer, 
And then the last one, EEG with QRNNs, uh, and in specific, um, they say it's either for, uh, you know, directly their use or, you know, for brain computer interfaces. So a lot of these, you know, it's, it, it's hardware dependent. So, uh, you know, it's just touching or it's just, you know, a little bit above as far as, as the results. And obviously with IBM news yesterday, this, you know, 400 plus qubit that could potentially be hybridized or modularized into 16,000 plus qubits um, has a lot of people talking and a lot of the other companies taking trips up there, including uh, President Biden to IBM. Uh, and that was uh, last month. So, you know, here's an example. So schematic of a uh, quantum convolutional neural network. Now, keep in mind, it's theoretically like, you know, getting your best results, learning over time. But as I'll show you a little bit uh, after this is basically that's the hardest thing to do with FDA approval because you have to be able to explain it. Um, and actually, they come up with uh, explainable AI, XAI, you know, these types of things. So everything must be considered as far as history. And, you know, what has the most uh, likelihood for uh, approval? So basically, this is a good table. So you can take a look at this. So quantum computing tools by manufacturer, so in specific, uh, you know, your Google, IBM, D-Wave, or Getty, definition of what they were used. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these are going to be changing. Oh, you know, it just, this is how it kind of is, you know, by the time they did this paper uh, this year um, kind of thing. So how to use advantages, I think you'll get most likely out of definition, probably challenge for these. Now, the second paper we're starting to get in, so this is the 2020, and this is basically saying 45% of devices say AI or ML in the actual FDA announcement. Now what this, um, you know, there's still some, you know, in healthcare uncertainty as far as like, what, where will all of this go, you know, with AI and ML? Um, but basically, you know, it's going through, especially these past couple of years, as you see in 2020, uh, 85% I had 510k approvals, 12% de novo uh, pathway, and 1% uh, a PMA. Um, so you'll see, so 47% of devices were developed for radiology. So that's the other, the assumption that I took with a startup is basically radiology and specific neuroimaging or neuroradiology um, is a good area. And then combine that with QML. So it looks like, you know, I'm kind of right there with the startup. Now, this is a, a cool graphic. So the, the main thing is that you'll see is there's multiple fields. So you'll get neurology plus radiology and you'll see them kind of merge together. Um, so if you're looking at, so these are, so this is machine learning clinical implementation. So this isn't, uh, so this is back in 2020. So this is the con conventional approaches, but it'll give you an idea as far as the struggles and the, and, the, and the victories, as far as what types of algorithms are getting um, accepted most often. So as you see, you'll see uh, this Arturus with Siemens and, and GE Healthcare, uh, uh, sleep disorders uh, diagnosis, you see Apple, ECG, which is electrocardiograph, uh, which is heart, and then also irregular rhythm notification for hearts too, and i.e. your Apple watches. Um, brain scope, um, so this is using, uh, all of these are AI or AI ML uh, for conventional. Um, so broad, uh, broad traumatic brain injuries. Now this one in specific has, has, has seen developments. So they had a previous one and then a new one, an updated. And you're gonna see that a lot. So if you have, uh, you know, approval by FDA, you know, uh, you're gonna have these other uh, processes uh, to allow you to up, update. And sometimes as soon as a couple days, uh, memory loss in elderly and then seizure monitoring as well. Now, uh, this term they put on it is uh, total product life cycle, TPLC, and it's for algorithms that are on the learning side. So they're not locked. Now, as I said, you can update within a short period of time, and then there's safeguards in, in place so that, you know, there's nothing um, basically, uh, you know, to, to address patient uh, concerns if, if something goes wrong uh, with the algorithm. Um, so... In specific, the FDA does not ask companies to say if the technology is AI ML. Like I said before, only 45% have chosen to list AI ML in the FDA registration. Um, but again, because you know, there's some, not all parties are fully educated on, on um, you know, machine learning. 
So the as far as the industry goes, $28 billion in um, approximately 2020, a little bit less. 2016, it was only a billion. Now I looked up, there is in 2028, $95 billion uh, forecast for this global AI ML uh, SAMS or software's medical device. Now the purpose of this paper specifically was to encourage the FDA to provide an overview of approved AI ML based med devices and algorithms. And as I'll show you in the, uh, the corresponding papers after this is some of that has been accomplished. So article number three, regulatory frameworks for di development and development evaluation of artificial intelligence-based diagnostic imaging algorithms, summary and recommendations. So this is also a 2020. Now this paper is unique. So it's the Stanford researchers and they're actual, the doctors, you know, their recommendations. So you get a lot of this kind of insight of what's, what's going on here. Yeah, UCLA, Kansas Medical Center, and I believe others as well. So they recommend separating diagnostic tasks from algorithm, defining performance elements beyond uh, accuracy, dividing the evaluation process into discrete steps, encouraging assessment by a third party evaluator, incorporating steps into manufacturer's development process. So not quite sure as far as how many of those has, have made in. Some may be hard, may, maybe both FDA companies uh, agree that it's just, it's not practical to do uh, certain things um, that's being asked, you know, you know, for the for the betterment, but it's just not uh, it's not practical. So algorithm performance may vary site to site. So what this means is basically you could have, you know, two different um, algorithms in two different places with the same exact inputs, and and they they operate a little bit differently to begin with. Um, and again, the whole thing with learning or in machine learning is getting a better final answer, not necessarily caring in specific that that initial one. Um, so keep in mind that any manufacturer is going to have a financial interest in the product and that these kind of like, you know, this kind of routes how the direction of these, uh, you know, eventual approvals happens. And societies may want a companion reference uh, and then for better standard adopted, maintained by a not-for-profit group. So artificial, so this is article number four. So artificial intelligence and machine learning and software as a medical device or SAM, S-A-M-D. And this is January 2021. The work is done at University. So this is UCSF, Stanford, and John Hopkins. Um, that's where the, the work is done. Now, this is really important. So we have software as a medical device. And then the SPS describes what aspects the of manufacturer intends to change through learning, right? So these are the more advanced algorithms that go through this. The locked algorithms aren't as powerful but don't have the issues that, you know, the ones that have greater learning. So the algorithm change protocol explains how the algorithm will learn and change while remaining safe and effective. And GMLP, so if you've ever worked in a research lab, you've heard of uh, GMP, uh, good manufacturing uh, processes. And in this case, it's good machine learning practice is for data management, feature extraction, training, interpretability, evaluation, documentation. So it's kind of like the, the hierarchy. And a, call, a lot of these calls, especially going back to 2020, has been for feedback. You know, how can the FDA make this uh, process better? So the guiding principle, so this is GMLP. So you could read through these. Um, so basically, what I got out of this, this is number one through four. So this is with FDA, um, Canada Health, uh, and then this other uh, kind of overseas regulatory agency is number seven. So on this page, human AI team. So that's just the way things are going to be. Um, likely AI, you know, we, we need something to tell what the AI should do. And it does specific tasks better and then humans other. So then from, you know, eight through 10, and you'll see through 10 at the end, it says used by the human AI team. Uh, so that's just an interesting perspective of, of where things are going. And in specific, in my earlier studies, I was told just get into data. You know, no matter what field you are in science, that's where everything's going. If you don't understand, you know, the basics of uh, machine learning or any of these, um, they're likely going to be coming to a lot more industries than you would think. Now, article number says uh, current challenges of implementing artificial intelligence in medical imaging. And this is August 2022. Um, so they looked at 29 FDA approved 
uh, AI ML uh, med tech. And the four challenges they listed, so keep in mind, this is this year, um, this is just a couple months ago, is for AI to be fair, trustable, transparent. We know that. Best practices and data sharing. Uh, stakeholders consensus. So this is a hard thing. So, and I'll share a little bit later as far as, you know, government technology hospital, what are their concerns or what are their questions? And to support, encourage, and spur innovation in healthcare. So basically, uh, we have this graphic here. So it kind of gives you this uh, route of using AI and having, you know, uh, data governance. So, you know, these things are first to consider patients' consent, data management, infrastructure, data quality. If you don't have good data, you're not going to wind up in a good spot. And especially the FDA, you know, and other regulatory uh, institutes, they, they'll uh, put your organization uh, under a microscope. And it's good because, you know, they need, basically they want good organizational leadership all throughout this process. So you have algorithm robustness, stakeholder consensus, which I'm going to get to, and legal liability I'm going to get to as well. Now, for uh, deep learning research, again, this is an this is an area that has huge potential, but the the issue with it is basically getting it approved, having it explainable to a, a certain extent, and it's been used in imaging for reconstruction from limited data, uh, which is good and improve resolution with lower radiation doses and reducing acquisition time. Now, in specific, reviews of DL algorithms in, in medical imaging have been done, um, and few uh, deep learning models are adopted so far in clinical. It just, it takes time, and it's, it's mostly that whole thing is like patient safety, do you fully under, uh, understand what the what the specific uh, machine learning algorithm is is doing? And they're prone to distortions, erroneous predictions. Um, now, many AI studies, and it says they use a retrospective approach, uh, you know, with big data, um, you know, is kind of dealing with all this. And here it is: sixty-five percent of companies are unable to give an explanation of uh, how the AI algorithm reaches its prediction or decision. And human error is the main cause of data uh, compromise. So there's, I think it was called HUG. It's, it's, I think it's a hospital overseas. So they had a big issue. And despite all of this, the what what this is saying is that the the human component is is uh, the thing that's most likely to uh, cause compromise. Now this XAI or explainable AI is for reasoning and and logic. And medical phys physicists play a big role in this. Um, so they ensured equipment and, and image acquisition protocols are in compliance for downstream AI development. And then radiologists and physicians uh, are, are for accurate diagnosis and labeling. Now, um, here's the questions that different groups ask themselves. So you have IT managers. Is data being misused for other businesses? Like, you know, are they taking it? Number two, policy in the hospital is AI algorithm um, trustworthy? You know, so that's that's the big thing is the patient safety, and then clinicians uh, losing autonomy capacity for critical decisions, and then workers uh, will this te technology alter the routine or increase their workload? You know, um, so model fairness is key uh, to avoid unfair outcomes on race and class. Now, over 50% of radiologists have limited uh, knowledge of AI. So that's why it's such a key thing is um, in many fields, you can't just learn one field. You have to learn two or three pretty well. And then, so if you want to get into quantum and do app applications, you really have to understand that field. And as far as this case, this is AI ML uh, regulatory. Now, patients may sue against the medical practitioners. However, the medical devices, the companies themselves, are protected under the learned intermediary uh, doctrine. Now, the history is that medical devices, going back many years, decades, have contributed to computerization and digital techniques in imaging and, and therapy, and also that medical physicists today want to gain more AI skills, right? So some people, based on their background or their education, it's just difficult to understand how data works and in specific, the more, uh, you know, learning data. Now this is article number seven. So uh, it's an update. So it's basically October. So last month of the FDA, and this is the number of FDA uh, AIML 
enabled medical devices by year. Now in specific, I'm gonna start with a, in the upper right hand corner, 1995 through 2017, um, you know, that's many years, 20 something years, uh, only 73 approvals for that whole span re regarding AI and ML, this for healthcare. Now, in 2018, 63 to 77, 102, 115, and then this year we're at 91. Um, so this number may likely, uh, you know, surpass the 2021 because it's not over with and there's delays. So all these years combined, 521 total approvals. It's not a ton, but then again, you know, the most uh, these past five years uh, basically have, have seen the biggest uh, number of approvals. So this article number eight, proposed regulatory framework for modifications to AI, ML, based software, and SAM. Uh, it's a discussion paper and I call it a how-to. So if you're looking to file or looking to start a project that would have a higher chance of FDA approval, this is the article. So they rank um, you know, your chance of, or, or they rank uh, different devices based on risk. Uh, so this is the first spectrum from lowest to highest, one to four. And the second uh, spectrum, which kind of goes along with it, uh, is locked to continuously learning. So that, that's a, a key thing. And it, it it's somewhat uh, reflective of risk, but not in all cases. Now, FDA assesses, the, this is where the culture and organizational excellence of a particular company expects periodic updates. In other words, to get your product with FDA approval, you know, you're going to have to be with somebody big or the big company, uh, more than likely, FDA approval. So this is an overlay, and this is specifically for the continuously lear learning uh, machine learning algorithms. And the way that I look at this, the easiest is the legend. So you have AI model development in the lower left-hand corner, which is white, which you see up here. You have AI production model in the gray, proposed TPLC approach. So again, um, you know, all the factors basically continuously updating algorithms even after they've been approved. And then AI device modifications in green there. So this is the process. So this is with, uh, you're SAMed with uh, SPS and ACP in specific, you know, which of these, um, it, it's basically your algorithm change protocol and SPS as well, um, revising things after things have been submitted. So QML in literature is, I, I've shared this before, this is the big table of uh, quantum artificial intelligence, April 2017. It's about two and a half pages. Um, so I included one of the pages. It goes from about 94 to about 2017. And it's a good overview. It's, it's more of the fundamentals as far as, you know, what's been done to help with uh, healthcare but not necessarily directly for the, the healthcare individual uh, applications. Now, these next three slides are basically that. This is healthcare hybrid QML articles. Some I'd mentioned in other places. It's just good to go along because there are advances in quantum, even at the stage of noisy intermediate scale uh, quantum. And even with these uh, you know, updates that we've gotten from IBM yesterday is basically saying, um, you know, and continue the the high cube higher the march for higher higher qubits, and then gradually get better with coherence and you know other things affecting uh, noise. So this is one page here. This is a second page here um, to kind of look at, and uh, you know, say for instance, CML, uh, a classical machine learning. So lots of these are hybrids. I'm looking at the Amen uh, J et al. Uh, with, um, you know, conventional GANs, and I've talked about QGANs or quantum GANs. So it just takes time, you know, for the quantum and incorporation, number one, to get good results, and then number two, to get them uh, approved by uh, regulations. Now, this is uh, some basics for QML. So as I mentioned before, QML is the uh, principal application for uh, quantum computing. So these are basics for quantum computing to understand. And then this is one of the uh, big articles. This is Los Alamos National Laboratory. And they're basically saying the more quantum, you know, uh, data, uh, you know, your algorithms, um, 
sensing memory and, and especially computing, the better chances of, of uh, quantum advantage. So in specific, you know, you have this, uh, you know, sample com complexity. So there's also time complexity. Those are the two. And it's, it's more suited to get better quantum advantage if you have, um, you know, this, uh, uh, like a brain that's uh, complex in nature. And then uh, these are some of the uh, basically things that uh, that's going to be upcoming for QML. Many things. So, and this paper is really important. So this is Caltech, Google, Harvard, and six others. And this is basically saying if you have good quantum sensing and good quantum memory, it can mitigate the error that today's quantum computers have. So if there's a breakthrough in quantum, we've already had some breakthroughs in, in quantum uh, sensing, but if we have more breakthroughs in quantum memory, you can uh, hold on to basically the, the programming task and tangle it for longer periods of time, getting your advantage there. And what this paper says is that um, the middle column, the principal component is no longer noise. Um, but is the part of the superposition with the highest probability. So an interesting paper. And then here are the results versus classical, you know, so less number of experiments and better segregated data on the right. Um, so the research that I'm looking at is basically uh, going to be focusing on quantum machine learning. Um, so as, uh, as a stand, you know, looking for eventual uh, approval, you know, with re regulatory bodies such as FDA. Now, to get to that point, there's many paths, right? So I could choose to say, for instance, work on quantum sensing, um, you know, quantum memory, quantum computing, quantum algorithms to get a better answer. Uh, and then that could be used for QML. But most likely in these uh, kind of days that the startup is going to be is, is more of the you know, the software approach of, you know, using today's best hardware, uh, using today's best sensors, whatever it takes um, to get better images uh, uh, for neuroimaging for Alzheimer's disease prediction. So on the right is current neuroimaging is machine lit learning driven. Um, so again, some of these likely fall under FDA approval. I think click through all of them. Um, but, it, you know, it's basically to, to say that we're going to start to see more hybrids, you know, so transfer learning. So uh, basically processes that already uh, exist today and then fine tuning with quantum um, is, is going to be the main thing because classical is still going to improve as well. Now, this is the big crux of all of this is basically your um, QML FDA regulatory agency challenges are better quantum. So most people focus on computing, but uh, sensing and memory uh, are both uh, vital as well. And then I talked about in specific memory, you know, so this whole Google Caltech Harvard paper is basically using quantum sensing and quantum memory to, uh, uh, you know, uh, help mitigate error off these, even their, you know, Google quantum supremacy paper back from this is, you know, October 2019. Now, in the LANO paper, Los Alamos National Laboratory, they go through all this as far as you have these local minimums and uh, barren plateaus. So local minimums will exist in the quantum world. And barren plateaus are basically, when you increase qubits, it's working against itself uh, to go down to an even narrower uh, channel uh, for programming. Now, this is a Forbes article, number three, is basically it says uh, deep neural networks or these, you know, highly um, continuously learning networks are relatively more difficult to evaluable to evaluate than their classical counterparts. Um, so I don't know if this is due to the random nature of quantum computers, uh, those types of things. Um, but basically, big companies are involved with all this. I, I think they're somewhat aware and it's also, you know, many things that are projected to use quantum in healthcare. Um, but yeah, some things just like how AI and ML took time, you know, from 2020 uh, until now to, you know, uh, more fully incorporate uh, some, um, not many, but some of these kind of deep learning 
uh, machine learning approaches. Now, the forecast for next year, you'll hear me in any place I go, is the NSF Practical Quantum Computer in 2023. Now, they also allow uh, grants for rentals. Um, so if you can prove that you, know, you have a, a worthy case um, to rent time on AWS for pets, um, and I, maybe even some of the other ones, such as uh, Google and Microsoft. Now, another big thing is a lot of these things, especially with quantum computers, is they're going to be up in the cloud. Um, so they're not going to be down, you know, stationed here, uh, you know, that have any significant power. And you know, when you're talking about HPC data centers, supercomputers, they're saying that 76% of the global uh, of these HPC data center centers will have some aspect by the end of next year. Um, and then letter C, IBM, so this is the big announcement from yesterday, so that was uh November 9th, 2022, is basically they have their new 400 plus um, uh, qubit, uh, you know, chip that's going to do all this. But they say with this modular design by the end of next year, I think they'll announce it ready for use, the 16,000 qubit, um, which if it's in, it, it'll be announced at that time. So the 16,000, you may or may not be able to touch, um, you know, until say early 2024 or something like that. I could be wrong on that. But, you know, basically big things ha have been announced. Now we still have the rest of this month. December tends to, to cool off a little bit. So I would expect to see a, a lot more announcements on the hardware. And, and again, with QML, the, the biggest issue um, is, is, is the hardware or the quantum computer. You know, even though, you know, memory and sensing can uh, help make things a, a better. So the, two, the, the progress this year has been pretty good. So as again, so QML is the most common application for QC. We see this in international countries as well. Now, this is the LANL paper. So sample complexity will likely be a QML advantage. So you're always looking for an application, you know, specific ways of things being better in using quantum than classical can't catch up even 510 or decades, uh, years down the road. Now, letter C is big. So IBM Cleveland Clinic began their first installation of a quantum computer in healthcare. Um, that was last month. And then um, now tying in with all this with conventionals, FDA has uh, approved a range of classical AI ML SAMs. So there's been, you can see from those four articles, basically this uh, um, you know, steady kind of uh, incorporation of you know, more deep learning. To a certain extent. Now, letter E, President Biden, President Obama support quantum. Um, so this is last month as well. And Biden's has quotes as far as, you know, in this specific area in New York being a, a quantum computing hub. And then President Obama visited the Chicago Quantum Exchange uh, to support, um, you know, students with their learning in quantum. Now, letter F, DC QNET, Argon, uh, Fermilab, quantum internet for, for data. So number one, DCQNet says we will have a national quantum internet. And then Argon and Fermilab are transmitting both uh, quantum and classical information at that same time. And what this means for healthcare data is basically, um, you know, you might see little trials as far as, you know, in a confined area like, you know, San Francisco Bay Area or upstate New York that, or Washington, D.C. or Chicago um, that can, you know, do certain things with uh, patient data. So I, I'd be on the lookout for something like that. And then we're getting Q control, Quantinium, AWS, all improved in different uh, aspects of hardware, software. Um, ADA, AWS is basically the biggest for uh, quantum cloud. Now, Fortune 500, Intel, IBM, Quantinium, Google are all part of this, you know, this quantum movement. And then especially, you know, IBM has been huge into healthcare and then, um, you know, Google Health too. So expect to see, you know, some good support from these huge companies, you know, with healthcare and quantum. We also had four IPOs uh, uh, going back to October 1st of last year. And then um, they've all been a billion dollars or plus. Um, these are like the boutique or uh, uh, better term, uh, pure, pure play quantum hardware. And then lastly, this $850 billion uh, annual uh, value. Um, so the way I interpreted that is by 2040, it's $850 billion due to quantum. It's a BCG report, and this one's actually from 2021. 
And then last year, uh, we had $3.2 billion in, in uh, private uh, funding uh, for quantum technologies. Now, there's many approaches. So this, so this is based on an ML TRL NASA article that I previously reviewed. And in specific, things are just going to go quantum. Um, so I'm calling it a QML TRL card for Alzheimer's disease prediction. And it, it, it's an example. And then it goes through like zero to nine. So it's a very rigorous approach. And I see it kind of hand in hand with the whole FDA approval process where if you can go through this and NASA kept mentioning healthcare would benefit from it, um, that it, it, it may increase your chances of FDA approval of your uh, software device. So these are other areas that are gonna be developing. So on the left, federated learning is kind of like a huge thing. So th there's already been a, a quantum federated learning article and it's, um, it's basically using a classical network, but at the individual sites that are training these models, you're using some you know uh, quantum aspect to it. And of course it's not approved or anything like that. Um, but as far as getting the results down on paper and then quantum GANs, GANs are a huge thing. Um, there's been pushes to get them into healthcare, but basically you're dealing with 90% artificial data, 10% uh, real data. And um, that's not always going to go over well as far as saying the images are, are somewhat artificial in order to generate, you know, more data, which is needed for training. So that's why GANs are, are used for in that specific case. So the quantum approach. So there's other aspects in quantum, you know, quantum sensing, imaging. QIP is unique, and I think that's more time complexity. So this is a, a really fundamental level of inserting qubits, like a red, green, blue, and then you have an alpha qubit kind of thing that you can do different things. Um, I'm going to touch on quantum circuits, and then, you know, I touch on those. So basically circuit optimization. So if you've listened to this discussion, this is 56 straight, is basically over these uh, you know weeks and months, we've it, what it, what has dawned on me is there's a lot of kind of innovation in making things work with noisy computers. So for instance, if we can do things, yeah, you know, there was a KNN uh, circuit that went from here like down to there um, as far as number of gates uh, with circuit optimization. So that's a key thing. So basically, that's the thing. If you can optimize circuits, even with the better hardware coming is, um, you know, you can get better QML advantage for better uh, neuroimaging. Now, this is the crux of basically uh, medical image processing. So the two main steps being image formation and image computing. And all along this it has machine learning, right? Because I've seen machine learning uh, even improve quantum sensors. I've seen machine learning for reconstruction. And then there's machine learning anywhere from enhancement um, and likely through visualization and probably management as well. So it's just going to come down to not if it'll work. It's a lot of it will be regulatory, right? By the time, you know, if, it, if and when it gets adopted there. So in sensing, these are big. Uh, so these are all diamond quantum sensing articles. So I chose the QPSD. Um, if I choose to go down this road, and it's um, it was used for noise reduction, and in this case, uh, vector magnetometry enhancement uh, can be done as well. And there's other articles on the bottom, ranging from placing quantum sensors really, really close to a rat's heart to the MIT, uh, you know, judging judging all frequencies, getting better accuracy through machine learning, and then um, improving your, or making readout readout noise uh, better or less. And then this is say, for instance, like going the whole way. So this is what uh, the Google Caltech uh, Harvard article did is incorporating sensing uh, algorithms, memory too, and then computing, um, setting up this environment um, so that you can get better quantum machine learning. Now the market opportunity is, is pretty good. So medical imaging marketing, about 45%. Quantum computing market at compound interval growth rate of 33%, and obviously next year uh, in a couple of months, uh, NSF. So it's it's not quite sure if that's early, mid, or late um, with this practical quantum computer. And then, so here's available decks. Um, so there's nine available, then this will be 10. Um, and they're specific for neural imaging. And then um, a lot of them are for QML as well. And then the chemical Q device mission statement is this, to improve neuroimaging techniques utilizing quantum technologies for better sensitivity signal 
and or resolution leading to advanced prediction in neuroradiology for Alzheimer's disease. This includes quantum sensing algorithms, computing and or memory. Um, with, and we're talking MRI, PET, uh, CT techniques. Now the roadmap is to develop in 2023 QML neuroimaging improvements utilizing medical research collaborations. Now, a lot of this has to have application. Alzheimer's, there's 6 million people in the US that are living with Alzheimer's. And then as you saw in the title slide, over $300 billion is spent annually um, for the disease. Now, this is an updated approach, um, you know, from 2020 in nature of basically, it's not just one thing. So it's not just amyloid beta, it's not, not just tau. Um, so these are articles to find on Neuroscience News. And then these are uh, organizations um, to be a part of. Now I volunteered at Alzheimer's Association, a walk in San Diego. Um, I did a San Diego Alzheimer's walk as well, uh, being an, as a volunteer. And then they're just good to be a part of. It's such a big thing. And you hear stories of people, you know, and especially with caretakers, that it's just, it's such a hard time for them, you know, especially if you have one parent and then they, they pass away. And then you have another parent that passes away within the next couple months, you know. Um, so this was the presentation. And again, so here are the stats. So six, over 6 million people, uh, Americans live with Alzheimer's in 2022. And then your $321 billion, um, you know, be, is the cost of Alzheimer's and other dementias uh, with Alzheimer's being the, the primary component of that. So there's that. And then we're going to switch back over here. Be interested to hear uh, kind of how people relate to all this, you know, anywhere from the, um, let's see here. Unmute. And then you, you'll be able, you're able to, Unmute, or you can come on yourself. And uh, yeah, it's definitely a process, you know. So with any technology, such as machine learning, that promises, you know, really big things, is that um, it has to go through all the steps as far as, you know, say if you want to, uh, you know, stop it halfway. Can a can a uh, human operator uh, have control over it? Those types of things. So. And I see a number of new people here. Uh, George, you're returning, so feel free to come on. And then uh, I think Connor's been on before, Connor O'Brien, and then America. Um, feel free to unmute or come on. And then if not, we have a number of new people and I, I'd like to hear from you. So the chat is open and then we go. Um, so obviously the, the big thing affecting all of this is the quantum computing hardware. And I'd expect to hear big things from other companies, even this month, it's only the 10th. And then say for instance, December dies down. And then in 23 is the month where uh, many people say uh, quantum computing uh, will be, uh, we'll start to see a lot more interesting stuff. Um, as opposed to kind of like these little applications or, or quantum annealing, those types of things. And then uh, if not, so uh, Greg, you're free to come on um, or Ilknor, uh, you're free to come on as well. I'd be interested to see, and you can post it in the chat as far as like, you know, are people coming from quantum or are people coming from healthcare? Are people coming from, uh, you know, Alzheimer's research, research or neuroimaging as well? And go ahead, Greg. Hey, Kevin. Uh, so yeah, this is my first time on with you. Um, I'm the CEO of Alzheimer's Treatment Centers of America. Uh, we're a startup, but uh, we use, uh, if you will, an expert system slash machine learning tool um, that's been patented um, that guides, provides guidance for practitioners um, for the treatment of Alzheimer's. In the study that was done on it, 75% of the patients had no further decline in their cogn mild cognitive impairment. So it was a pretty powerful uh, <clears throat> algorithm um, that was created and stuff. So your area you're working in is really about the 
a diagnosis of Alzheimer's as opposed to anything that helps us treat it? Right, so it's essentially for better imaging, um, so better pictures. So this is, you know, the slide where it says so uh, image formation and image computing, it's finding areas where conventional is lacking. So these could th be things that take too long or just not possible at all. And as I mentioned on that slide, it's basically ML has been making headway in a lot of these steps. And then obviously the hardest part is approval, especially with the more kind of uh, advanced um, algorithms. Well, I guess what I'm getting at is um, our effort is to work with people to help them slow down the rate of decline or potentially improve. Some of the 75% started improving in their mild cognitive impairment. So on the one hand, it's less important for us to image anything relative to the brain if in fact you already have tools to slow down the degradation, um, unless those tools can point us in the right direction as far as, oh, with this image, we now actually can use this intervention protocol for this patient versus a different patient, we might use a different intervention protocol. So where, where do you see your stuff going? Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be alternate approaches. Now, see, for instance, Johnson Johnson was just on a call this morning through for investor related. Now, they were saying um, that they want to move everything to blood work and, and then do blood work to try to understand, uh, you know, the the effects of Alzheimer's in the blood, you know, coming from the brain, which has been a hard thing to do, and then still have neuroimaging and all these other things to supplement. Now. As with anything, there's a shortage of data, um, high quality data. And especially it, if you want to go off site, like federated learning, um, if you're just based centralized, you don't have a very broad data set. It's just those individuals in that area. Um, so, yeah, I think high quality images are always going to be in demand. So, even if you have a generative adversarial network, again, um, and then and especially as it starts to go towards QGANs, is that you still need 10% real data and it needs to be the best in order to generate more data. But yeah, that's the whole approach is, is basically with chemical Q devices, better images to get better diagnosis, better prediction, um, because you, you can see more and that can be anywhere from quantum sensing to more likely the QML approach, uh, you know, substituting quantum where it makes sense. What is it likely to have one of your scans cost when you get up and running? Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, so basically there's things in the quantum world that can be done that conventional computing would take thousands of years. So that's an argument of using quantum in those cases. Yeah. And then in other cases, it, you know, if it's, if it's contributing to better imaging, it just depends, right? Because if you're talking about a QML algorithm for sensing, for reconstruction versus image computing, enhancement, visualization, is that they're all gonna have their very specific nuances. Um, so, I mean, give me a range. Well, it's just like, again, it, 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 I guess the closest example is taking transfer learning, which people have done in healthcare with Alzheimer's, and then just, it, incorporating a little bit of quantum to fine tune the whole thing. Now, I, I didn't see a dollar amount in their paper and it, it, you know, it takes a little bit as far as, you know, getting that to, to preciseness. I guess what I'm getting at is, is this going to be a thousand dollar scan or is it going to be a $50,000 scan or a $10,000 scan? <laughs> So the, the quantum computing is the limiting factor. So say, for instance, if, if many experts are saying that quantum computers will be up in the cloud the next two to three years, and we can rent them. Um, yeah, I, I don't have an accurate number because it's, it's so dependent on the specific thing. Like I said, like if you have men, most things classical because tr they're tried and true, and then you're inserting this quantum aspect that's not that much continuously learning and potential for FDA approval. I guess the best answer I can give you is that 
you know, IBM, Amgen, Roche, you know, many companies have been experimenting with QML for healthcare and that's going to continue. So, I mean, here's why I'm trying to figure this out because, you know, hey, if the cost is going to be in a $500 to $1,000 range, then you could see it usable for almost every patient, even if it's a cash pay item. And that can provide us the most precise precision, precision medicine tools coupled with our machine learning relative to other body systems as to how to help the patient. However, if it's going to be a ten or 20000 thing and it's going to be paid out of cash, out of pocket, then basically it prices itself out of the market except for an extreme few people in the world. So less exciting because um, one of the things that we have discovered through all of our research is that um, there are a hundred contributing factors to Alzheimer's. You know, it, it's basically body systems. Each patient with Alzheimer's typically has 10 to 20 to 30 compromised body systems that develop over 20 to 30 years. And it's the combination of those body system compromising, creating a compromised metabolic system that tends to lead to then the compromised brain. So really it's for us, it's more about almost a whole body imaging, you know, is anybody using quantum uh, computing to do whole body imaging? Well, I mean, the trend is going the other way. So in 2009, there was a NIST article using it's called a diamond quantum sensor. And they said that it could one day use as a tip at the end of a probe, as opposed to going into a full out MRI in a specific area. Now it took them until I say 2021, to develop the algorithm to understand fluorescence. So it's the red that comes off this magnetic field that is placed in say like a heart. And there's a number of things pointing in that direction as, as, as far as going uh, um, more local as opposed to like a, a whole kind of thing. Um, but already there's diamond sensors and CT, um, CT scans, so, you know, using x-rays and they're on the receiving end. So this is after the x-ray patient passes through the patient, you have this diamond quantum sensor. Now, in quantum sensing, you have to be careful because MRIs and lasers are technically operate by quantum mechanics and they're deemed quantum sensors. So the new generation, these diamond quantum sensors are thought to be, they're biocompatible anywhere. They're talking about sensing inside of cells, you know, and, um, you know, inertness and uh, they can be used uh, for uh, uh, voltage, uh, uh, magnetism, um, force, strain, um, those types of things. So yeah, the biggest thing out there is the computing. Now, when you were say, talking, and feel free, if anybody else wants to come in too, or uh, you can pass yeah. uh, questions too, um, is it's called Amazon Hybrid Jobs. So it allows you to send up the, a task to their cloud system, and then you do most of it conventionally. And then the remaining part is done on more expensive quantum hardware. Um, now, keep in mind, they just added another quantum hardware company. I think it's QERA. So they have, I think, five different quantum hardware companies. So there's going to be good competition, um, those types of things. But it's, I, that's how a lot of people see it is, is basically hybrid QML taking uh, chunks, you know, with things that make sense with that, that have a higher chance for approval such as transfer learning, and which has already been done, um, but not approved, and then inserting quantum here and there and there where it makes sense. Um, and again, we're talking areas where quantum mechanics, uh, it, that you can't do quantum mechanics classically. So in this case, use quantum, some type of quantum technology um, to improve it significantly, even if it's not like a full out thing. So the... Um... The company that we work with, the, the patent on our protocol, uh, the patent says basically in a broad sense, the use of a computer to solve for cognitive impairment is the patent. It's a very broad patent, which was developed in 2014. And then there's been three add-on patents since then. Um, so it would assume, it would seem that anybody else working in the area of Alzheimer's would be violating that patent when they're using a computer. Is that not the case? I, I've never read it. I don't know. Yeah. So 
the we are Alzheimer's Treatment Centers of America, so we only treat one disease. There's very, there's very few medical organizations in the world that only treat one disease. You know, everybody else is a generalist, and you know, we're in essence uh, an assembly line because we only do one thing. All of our systems are set up that way. So, at some point, you know, down the road, as cost effectiveness gets there, we want to be on the leading edge not bleeding edge, we, but we want to be on the leading edge of every technology like this that can add benefit to our precision medicine protocol uh, for helping people, you know, treat uh, cognitive impairment, all forms of cognitive impairment. Um, so certainly imaging is one of those things. But, you know, in some respects, brain imaging is sort of like an audit. You know, it's like, oh, yep, you have a problem. <laughs> It's like, well, the patient already knows they have a problem through cognitive testing and things like that, or just the fact they can't remember where to put their keys. Um, you're more precisely defining the nature of the problem, but does are you seeing that that can give any insight to the practitioners on how to solve the problem? I mean, I, I look at it as a very fundamental issue is basically if you have a blurry image, I, I've read a number of uh, you know, different Alzheimer's and all different types of techniques, EEG, MRI, everything. Now, if you have a blurry image compared to a clear image, that, that, that's the basis of, of getting better prediction, right? Because you, you can see in more detail of what's going on. So say, for instance, in quantum sensing, you can get better sensitivity, resolution, these types of things. You know, it's been shown to do that because it could be placed closer due to the inertness of the diamond. Um, now, you know, in other areas, so, you know, it, quantum image processing, quantum imaging, all these types of things is that there's just, there's inher inert, uh, or inherent benefits of, of saying like for quantum ghost imaging for faint images that just don't show up. Now, the issue is it takes a ton of computation and they kind of fixed it with an artificial neural network that was conventional. Um, and that could go anywhere if you know like shot noise. So that's inherent noise that's in most devices. Um, there's quantum subshot noise um, using the advantages of entanglement and having two photons in two different places, but they're still sensing each other, even though one never saw the image um, kind of thing. So there's all these different approaches to go, to go in quantum. And um, I guess my call to action is basically to collaborate with medical professionals that deal with neuroimaging data on their daily basis. And then, um, you know, basically to say what takes too long, right? So what do you avoid because it's just not practical for a quantum approach to go into or what's just not possible at all, you know, using conventional computing. Um, it's just different because there's certain things that classical does better than uh, quantum. And then likewise, you know, quantum better than classical. So quantum can't do real numbers. It does complex numbers, linear algebra and um, uh, quantum mechanics. So yeah, they, it's a very specific thing when you start to talk about all these and that's where I'm kind of uh, looking to go into. I have a meeting or it's actually like an event tonight at one of the universities here and running into these people basically saying, number one, their biggest issue with any big organization is why should they take on a startup? So what's, what's the terms, right? What's the IP? You know, how much IP do they get? That's usually the biggest thing. However, at the same time, a lot of universities, um, I, I think it's with, so the whole, you know, advanced machine learning DL is that they tend to have more reputable data, like trusted by other regulatory agencies and say, like a big corporation. Um, so there's advantages in all these types of things. Um, but yeah, as far as neuroimaging, that's where I see things going. Is that I've, I've read all these papers and it's just like anywhere, just like a, a standard medical image processing with formation and computing, going through all those steps and understanding them and then reading these papers to say, oh, okay, we've used quantum approach for this specific aspect in reconstruction, which is a huge thing. And MIT has a paper on this uh, from two years ago on uh, Medical image, uh, medical imaging algorithms, and then in specific reconstruction. So, so we're really we're a we're a, <clears throat> we're still a startup ourselves, and so um, 
um, you know, we're out in the capital markets ourselves, raising capital for um, scaling. We, we've been in, we pretty well have, have our beta stuff done. We've been in business for about a year, year and a half. And uh, we're really proving everything out. Now we're ready to scale, but um, uh, we're looking for some funding for that. But the point is that, again, we do one thing. We do Alzheimer's. So what we do, what I'm doing is I'm looking for you know, people that we want to partner with as we scale this thing, because we want to become the best Alzheimer's treatment organization in the world. Um, you know, I'm a Harvard Business School graduate. I've run multi-billion dollar companies and stuff. And so I'm, I've scaled things before. Um, so this is not to run one little clinic. This was, I got into it because, you know, we have a game plan to uh, take this large. Now, when you talk about data, um, you know, one of my previous companies, I used to be the president for Progressive Auto Insurance Company for the Southeastern United States. And we had a motto, which was, in God we trust, everybody else has to bring data. And, you know, same thing here, really. Uh, as we construct our clinics, they're, they're really going to be, you could consider them to be a research institution with highly, highly structured data capture is the fundamental premise. Now, imagine that you're getting, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 patients, a million patients of data where you're getting um, kind of closed loop feedback data using, uh, you know, eventually remote patient monitoring, bio wearables down the road, um, constantly feeding back up into an AI system or possibly again, you know, feeding up into your quantum machine. So yeah, I think there's plenty of opportunity there for quantum because then once you have um, analysis, you can then change the chronic care management protocol going out to the patients. Uh, yeah. And certainly I would think quantum computing will fit in there because the amount of data that we can generate starts to overwhelm typical machines, if you will. Yeah, and just a little thing, quantum computing is not good for big data as on its own, but QML is. So for quantum machine learning, you load a little bit at a time to the quantum computer and the QML is what does everything else. So this is with other conventional things. So yes, QML, you know, is, is they say for big data, basically. Um, okay. And the, yeah, this is all awesome. Uh, I'm glad you came on. Um, does anybody else have anything? Uh, any other questions or comments? I saw America come on. Uh, you can come on, I Am Confident Foundation. <laughs> or and end uh feel free to come on or you could chat you could unmute yourself or you could uh come on it's up to you so kevin i, I, I kevin i just wanted to say i truly enjoyed the presentation i learned uh so much this information is extremely valuable for enhancing and making changes in the medical world, especially for diseases. So thank you so much for sharing. And Greg, you also gave me uh, a wealth of knowledge about Alzheimer's as well. Thanks for starting your treatment center. Thanks, Yolanda. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, I appreciate you coming on, y Yolanda. Um, so definitely there's a lot of people that just stay in touch with quantum and quantum and hair healthcare. I would say, Yolanda, you're probably one of them. And then um, other people, so America, I met America at uh, Tech Coffee and uh, in San Diego. And then um, I, I feel free to pitch yourself, America, as far as, I, I think she does front end development. Uh, John C., um, I saw you come on as well. And then uh, Connor, I, I, I recognize you, um, but feel fr free to come on. And uh, yeah, so just, you know, keep your eyes peeled, especially because we're getting, especially this IBM Cleveland Clinic, it, a quantum computer that, that says a lot to me um, as far as like moving it outside of the IBM warehouses where they have lots of quantum computers. And one person said more than anybody else in the industry. And then it's going into healthcare. So it's, I, I highly doubt it's just going to sit there. <laughs> That's my approach to that. Um, but yeah, you know, with the IBM quantum um, hardware announcement yesterday is I, I saw uh, Worley, who is the, uh, um, he's the found, he's the CEO of Strangeworks, which is kind of like they tie all these 
quantum pieces together for clients, uh, they shipped their whole company, it looked like, or at least their management team to just go see this IBM announcement. And if you look at your Google alerts, uh, it takes up the whole page <laughs> just because there's so Reuters and everybody, you know, Reuters doesn't post too much in quantum. Now, um, yeah, I appreciate everybody coming on. And then definitely, you know, stay posted. And then this is kind of like that that time. I would say we had a boom kind of like back uh, October, or at least for me with the first IPO for pure play quantum hardware. And then now we're, uh, you know, kind of swinging back around with, um, you know, going through a lot of these healthcare QML papers, figuring out what worked, what didn't, how can we make these COVID QML papers, you know, uh, approved uh, for usage. Um, so it didn't quite catch that that bandwagon, but I'm sure people aren't giving up. Um, but yeah, keep posted with the quantum. Um, this has been episode 56. I appreciate everybody coming on. I appreciate the discussion um, very much. So feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. And then, um, you know, so looking like, uh, so yeah, episode 56. So November 10th, 2022. So looking like 57, uh, next week, keep posted on the topic. Um, have a good rest of your day and thanks for coming on. Take care. Bye-bye.